Welcome to the Azapo online political education series. Uh, my name is Khaun Tibale Nodoba. Uh, I'll be playing host to you this afternoon as we tackle the topic that I believe is going to create a lot of insights and also get a lot of tongues wagging. Uh, Blackness on trial, 1975 to 1976, is this a catalyst for the Azanian revolution or not? Uh, let me say before I introduce our, our, our guest uh, this afternoon, uh, let me indicate that uh, September is a month uh, in the Black Consciousness family and to Black Consciousness organizations and Black Consciousness adherents is a very special month for us. Yes, we know that in this country, since the advent of uh, democracy, 1994, we speak about uh, the 24th of September being Heritage Day, and therefore month of heritage, but in the Black Consciousness Movement, this is the month of Black Consciousness. We, we say this is the month of Stephen Bantu Biko. We say this is the month when we reflect as an organization, as a movement, about what befell us as an organization, the atrocities that our leaders had to face. But not only that, there is a month that gives us an opportunity to reflect where we are as a people, where we are as the movement of Stephen Bantu Biko and his, and his peers and, and colleagues. It's also a month that allows us to conduct an introspection as a people, as black people, as to where are we? When we are in power, we see blackness being on trial. We, we take stock and uh, we go down memory lane to say, where did our society go wrong? On the 6th to the 12th of September, we remember that period particularly as the BC week, during the week when Stephen Bantubiko was arrested, Stephen Bantubiko tortured, and finally carelessly and brutally killed by the merciless and inhumane uh, proponents of the sin against humanity called apartheid. This afternoon with me, having given you that particular background information, I'm playing host to none other than someone who is uh, not a stranger on this platform of the uh, Azapo online political education series. I'm playing host to comrade, uh, I will call him Ntate because he's my senior, Professor Seth Cooper. Professor Cooper was uh, born on uh, December 11th, 1950 in Durban, now, I must state this as a disclaimer up front that uh, I can speak about the CV of uh, Comrade Coop up until the cows come home. And it's very modest. Therefore, I'm just going to touch on some of the snippets. 
uh, of the issues and then leave it there. He, like I said, he was born on the 11th uh, of, of December in 1915, Durban. He, he was the first, or, uh, first uh, African president of uh, uh, the International Union of Psychological Sciences. He, by profession and trade and practice, is a clinical psychologist by training. He's a past vice president of Azapo. He, he was also incarcerated on Robben Island from 1976 to 1982. He was then also one of the trialists on what we call what was known as the BP, as, 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 as the BPC, Sasso, Sasso BPC trial. In fact, he was, I think, if I'm not mistaken, accused number one. In that trial, Stephen Bantubiko was the key witness for the defense. And uh, maybe Comrade uh, Seth will come and take us through some of those issues as he reflects. Uh, when he got released from Robben Island, like he said, he took leadership in Azapo. But before then, before he went to Robben Island, he is one of the people together with Stephen Bantubiko, that when one of the founding members of SASO, the South African Student Organization, and uh, he in 1972 was elected to become the Black People's Convention Secretary when it was launched as well. Now, as he was an activist of SASO, he was also one of uh, what we call the Sasso Nine, uh, who were arrested in 1974. He spent time uh, uh, in terms of banning, house banning, I think nine or, so, nine or so years, five years on Robben Island. And uh, we must mention here that he shared the same block uh, of prison with, uh, with the late uh, former president uh, of South Africa, uh, Ndate uh, Bao Madiba. Now, let me end there by introducing Comrade Sets and say to him, uh, welcome my elder, welcome Comrade Sets. We have got a topic Comrade, uh, Blackness on Trial 1975 to 1976, a catalyst for the Azanian revolution. We would like you to share with our viewers in Azania, in the diaspora and in the world. Share with us your reflections as one of the 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 four the front runners of black consciousness, one of the contemporaries of Stephen Van Tupico, someone who was in the struggle when it was not fashionable to become part of the struggle, but you here we are today, and we talk about Professor Seth Cooper. Over to Comrade Seth. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, fairly long introduction, but uh, I just. Just a couple of uh, corrections. I was actually born on the 11th of June. Uh, for some reason, um, December is put out there on social media. I haven't bothered to correct it, but uh, uh, there, the issues that I've been asked to address probably are reflected in how this philosophy, this ideology, gets reflected in our historical narrative. It is appropriate to state right at the beginning of my position, and that is that there are only two native homegrown ideologies to emerge in the modern state that we call South Africa one of only three entities that's given a geographic name, the other two uh, also being in Africa. Apartheid is a homegrown ideology that hasn't been correctly, as you point out, uh, described as a crime against humanity. And what emerged as a direct response to that thesis, if you use the Hegelian dialectical, the antithesis was black consciousness. And that was a homegrown product. Yes, it had antecedents uh, in other places, particularly in the um, negritude, movements spawned in the Caribbean islands and in black power, just as apartheid had its 
and origins in Nazism. But there isn't another homegrown response to that phenomenon. And that phenomenon has so overwhelmed all aspects of our lives that it still remains something we have to contend with all around us. All around us, we see the shattered psyche of Black people. We see things, we hear things that we do to ourselves that if Black consciousness had seriously taken root, we wouldn't be talking about that negation of self. So Black consciousness was on trial. We can draw parallels with other uh, trials, but it's important to recognize that the intention of the state was to completely obliterate all semblance of Black consciousness in the very indictment that it presented to us after we were brought to trial on the 31st of January, 1975, after uh, some four plus months of being held in solitary confinement, there were 11 of us, uh, 12 of us brought to trial. And of those, it's interesting to note that Nom Sisi joined us as the 14th accused. And very quickly, when the first indictment was about to be quashed because of the assault on the veracity of that indictment by our legal counsel, the Deputy Attorney General decided to withdraw the charge sheet. The result that the nine accused, who are now known as the Sasso BPC nine, remained on trial. So of those 14, Nomsisi is late, as is Ruben Hare and Solly Ismail, who comprised the original few. And of the Sasso nine, Muntu Mieza, accused number two, Srini Moodley, accused number nine, and Aubrey Mokwape, accused number four, also have left us. So what we do have is a reducing number of accused who can speak to and attest to what is already in the public record. The trial goes into thousands, tens of thousands of pages. And I'm going to um, indulge you with some aspects of that trial so that you can get a glimpse of the seriousness with which we were confronted with the charges that were all under the notorious Terrorism Act. This Terrorism Act replaced previous uh, security uh, legislation. It replaced the Criminal Law Amen a Procedure Amendment Act, the Sabotage Act, and the Terrorism Act of 1967 was used for the first time and last time against young people for the words they spoke, the ideas they developed, for the speeches they gave, for the writings that they put out. There has never been another trial where words, where ideas were on trial. It takes one back to all those witch hunts that were held in the Middle Ages and since. And I'll leave that to your imagination. But the Terrorism Act was one that everyone was transfixed by with terror. Everybody was terrified of the Terrorism Act. And when you were detained under that act, it was almost as if you involuntarily 
had no control over your bowels and your urinary tract because of the fear that was there with what happened to persons under the Terrorism Act. I want to state that for most of my co-accused and I, and for others who were detained, and there were over 200 persons detained from the 24th of September, 1974, into the following January of 1975, including, as you know, the current president of this country. There are many who have served in high office in various places, including the past uh, Azapo president, Musiburi Mangana, who have similarly been impacted by the Terrorism Act. But this period also gave rise to a cohort of leaders that was second to none. So if you trace all cabinets in this country, you have persons who came from that background. And the Sasso BPC trial actually was a site of conscientization. And I hope to, if I've forgotten to mention that, you can, mention, you can raise that during the question time. But just to give you an idea, the late Nkosi Molala, who was a president of ASAPU, Ronnie Momwepa, who was a leading uh, activist and was spokesman in government and, and the ANC, were conscientized by this trial. If you speak to many persons within the Black Consciousness fold and outside that fold, they were conscientized by this trial. How did it come about that this conscientization took place? I should point out right at the outset that the assault by the state against Black Consciousness and its different organizations was very severe. And after the formation of the BPC in July 1972, when I was one of the interim executive members. And by the way, I wanted to point out another in, uh, issue. I was uh, never vice, uh, I was vice president of uh, Azapo, but I was also its president in 1985 into 1986. Some of the facts which sometimes get hidden or are not easily available to us because we may uh, not think that they are that important. However, mine is to point out the seriousness with which the state viewed Black consciousness. In, on the last day of October 1971, when after Amir Timor was murdered in police custody, there were nationwide raids, and quite a few of us were raided by the feared security police in the early hours of the morning in a very uh, coordinated raid. It was around 4 a.m. that all of us were raided. And as a result of that raid, I was detained. I was detained because my name was on that list as were many of our names because we were activists. And Ahmed Timor knew us and added us to his list of persons that he came into contact with. And obviously that list became available when the police detained him. Going to, well, not going, forcibly removed to the security police headquarters in Fisher Street, Durban, I was put in a, an office that served as a mess, if you like. It was a conference room, but it also had the organogram of the security police and it showed who was in charge. It showed who was below that person and the different divisions that they had. They had a division dealing with persons who were banned uh, under the Communism Act and any other 
similar act. They had a division dealing with incursions, uh, a smaller division dealing with incursions and terrorism. Remember that the Terrorism Act was already in force then. And that they had a small section talking of internal resistance where it included Sasso and a few church organizations. Two years later, detained when we organized um, and were part of the Durban strikes at the beginning of February 1970, um, or was it end of January 1973, I had occasion to be held in that same conference room. And lo and behold, the organizational charts had changed. There was a new section which towered over the others. And that section was called Swartmach. It had Sasso, it had BBC, it had various other uh, programs under it. The band section was reduced to a smaller one, as was the incursion the external terrorism incursion threat. So from that period, what the state was confronting was a rise in consciousness and political mobilization caused by SASO, PPC, SASM, and all the other organizations that next month we will celebrate on the 19th, when the largest number ever by far the overwhelming majority of organizations to be banned, were banned. Yet the narrative remembers that as Black Wednesday, as an assault on media freedom, when it was the world and the Sunday world. And um, Veritate, the, the Christian Institute publication that was banned, but some 19, consciousness organizations were banned and those get completely obliterated by the record and we too tend to fall into that same trap we recognize it as black wednesday now i want to just point out that the choice of using the word black in direct opposition to what we were called before whether we were called uh, bantu native in capitals whether we were called plural whatever else we were called, we decided in 1970 and particularly in 1971 that we were going to stop the word non-white from being used to describe us. Now, in the ordinary scheme of things, this may not sound like a very revolutionary act, but when you confront the epistemological oppression epistemology that becomes violent in how they describe, arrogate unto themselves the descriptions for the majority, then you will understand how this was a brave act, an act that turned the tide on how young people and the greater population began to view themselves, not in the way it's reduced now to its narrow ethnic cocoons, when 27 years after democracy, we have made ethnicity into an important blank, and thus the fracture amongst our, our people grows deeper. That assault on blackness, we heard the last well, just over a week ago, where Harry Nengukulu talked of his interaction, his and Bani Pichana's interaction with the editor of the Rand Daily Mail, Alistair Sparks, who just simply was implacably opposed to the word black and asking him why he was bent on it. And he was very honest in saying that that word was something that they did not favor, that they were looking for their own word to describe us. Lest we forget 
at the Sasso GSC, its annual Congress in June 1972. I think on the second day uh, after Sono was expelled, newspaper reporters were expelled, those from the staff, including Boko Mafuna, those from the Grand Daily Mail and others were expelled because their newspapers continued to use the word non-white to describe us. And as many of us have pointed, we cannot be an appendage of somebody else. You cannot describe my glasses as a non-cell or device that you are looking at now as we talk. You have to describe the essence of the glasses. You have to describe the essence of that device. And more importantly, when you're discussing human beings who all belong to one human family, you cannot describe them in terms of a diminution of somebody else, a negation of somebody else. So when you take away the white from that term, non-white, you are left with not, nothing, nihil, to be dispensed with. And that was an important march forward in describing the Black condition, describing Black identity, and importantly, Black solidarity in the struggle against that phalanx of white racism. However, it derived at that moment from its colonial and its apartheid uh, representations. So this topic begins to be quite important because blackness continues, I aver, to be under attack, under attack by formal and informal media, by our intellectual and other classes, because to sustain true blackness will mean a defeat of all that is wrong and all that is going awry around us. Because to understand that essential blackness means overcoming everything else and ridding yourself of being part of somebody else, learning thievery, the corruption, and other aspects that defy the quintessential beingness that is one with our people as they continue to strive in the quest for true humanity. I think it's important to point out that when we were first brought to uh, the regional magistrate's court, on the 31st of January, 1975. It was a special session. It was at night. And many of us were brought in from not only Pretoria prison where we were held in solitary confinement, but from other uh, police stations in the, in the Pret greater Pretoria area. And when we first looked at each other, you know, I, for instance, no, I couldn't recognize most of my co accused I looked at them and they looked different. They, all of them looked pale. And I looked around and thought, now what, is, what are these white guys doing in a cell where white guys arrested? And Muntu's hair gave him away. And I realized that by the way, we were so pale because we hadn't seen sunlight for over four months, that I probably looked the same. That evening began our journey to not only uh, appearing in Pretoria's palace of so-called justice, but it was a journey where we were taken by pillion riders. We had a few cars, both marked and unmarked. We were the original Blue Brigade, 
Blue Light Brigade from the 31st of January right until the 21st of December the following year, 1976, when we were convicted. Every day we had pillion riders, we had police cars, we had marked and unmarked vehicles stopping at crossroads, stopping other traffic so that we could get as quickly as possible transportation from um, Pretoria prison to the Palace of Justice. And on that late afternoon of Friday, the 31st of January, 1975, so fast did those guys ride that truck in which we were in, that to keep our sense of self, we began to sing um, songs. And we sang songs and that tradition continued. So originally as a me mechanism to keep our soul together, not fear that we would crash, it became a late motif that we would sing every day, at least one major freedom song that became a ritual. And whenever that train of cars and that uh, huge truck passed by, people stood waiting for us um, around nine, 8.30 to nine o'clock each morning when our trial was on. And we would hear and see people responding to us with cries of Amandla or Matla. And quickly our truck was cordoned off. There were blinds, there, were, there was a tarpaulin put over it and we objected and they removed the tarpaulin after a while, after the next uh, day, but they welded the openings shut. And in those fists out, and we put our fists out, out of every possible opening to shout out a mantra. And that too was welded off. I should point out, uh, as I mentioned, that the attack on black consciousness was severe. The bannings took its toll. And when Frilimo was about to take nominally office in Mozambique, right next door to us, Untu Mieza and I had this discussion at the end of August, beginning of September, 1974, that we cannot allow this event to pass by without us marking it. And so we held what we called the Viva Frelimo rallies. The state called it the pro Frelimo rallies. Significant difference in our view because we used for the first time publicly the term Viva and associated with, with Frelimo, a so-called terrorist organization that was waging war against the Portuguese. And because the Portuguese regime had collapsed, Frelimo was taking over in Maputo and elsewhere. And so began what was the ill-fated Viva Frelimo rallies organized in different parts of the country. The ones that were attended were in Turf Loop and uh, the, what is now the University of Limpopo grounds and in Curry's Fountain in Durban, because there wasn't media then that we could rely on or radio, especially to announce that the rallies had been called off. And so it was that on the 25th of September and into the following months, leader after leader of the organization was arrested and held in solitary confinement throughout the country. The police that had gathered in Pretoria and environments came from all the security police officers, however large or small they were, because they had a few persons in detention from those areas that were held in 
the greater Pretoria area, including Flakpas, by the way, where Cyril Ramaphosa and a few others were held. That evening, we went into that magistrate's court and found that there was security police. There were no black persons in that court, except us, the accused. And there was Ismail Ayn. We were surprised that he was there, but we welcomed the fact that he was defending us. And when the court was called to order, the prosecutor started speaking in Afrikaans. And it was Muntu, Neff, and others who understood Afrikaans very well. I did not understand Afrikaans because I did not study Afrikaans. They began to say, we speak in English, we don't understand Afrikaans. Just for the benefit of the Srini, uh, Moodley, Lingam Moodley, and myself. So the other accused started saying, we don't understand Afrikaans, which then brought proceedings to a halt. And it's significant that I'm raising this because we had just come out of detention, varying forms of solitary confinement, uh, well, varying periods of solitary confinement, all having been tortured, some grievously. And within an hour and a half of being released from detention, this group of young persons in their early to mid twenties, not only sang their way to court, but challenged the use of Afrikaans in an Afrikaans court. Ayo brushed to us and said, chaps, chaps, it doesn't matter. This is just a formality. And everyone said, no. We need to understand every word and every word shall be explained to us if we don't understand Afrikaans. So of course, the court was to find interpret and eventually they found one about 30 minutes later and the proceedings continued. In that time, we asked Ayub how it was that he appeared as our uh, when who have in, informed him because we wanted Shan. Uh, we wanted Shan Chetty, our lawyer, to be with us. And he said, well, chaps, you know, Shan is, uh, knows about this and so on. It's only a few days later we realized that this was not true. And we fired Ismail Ayub, um, who was Mandela's lawyer and uh, has gone down in history as somebody who's even taken Mandela for a ride with the so-called signatures of his so-called artwork. In court, at every occasion, we retained our spirit of defiance. I don't know now, well, we were in our 20s then. Now, most of us are in our late 60s and early 70s. Thinking about that persona, then is almost like a different persona that was not going to bend at all to any force, any whim of the apartheid system. And I'm going to give you an indication of what transpired in that court where, unlike any other trial that any of you know, we were completely in charge of that court. We, could, we decided what our lawyers would put forward outside of the arguments that were legal. We determined who our witnesses were going to be. And thus it was that we had a number of key black consciousness leaders who were under house arrest, banned, and from different parts of the country brought to Pretoria to be potential witnesses. And we also use that platform to proclaim to our country and anyone else who would want to listen what Black consciousness was about. So I commend the organizers for actually having the title that you have 
because that title is very apt for this trial. In around August, uh, end of August, beginning of September 1975, when there was a new charge sheet, the old one, I should say, really, they, the state went into depth about black consciousness. And if you want to know what the impact of black consciousness is, one should look at the charge sheet. It tells you almost in stepwise form what would happen if black consciousness was allowed to develop. One of them being the June 16, 1976 uprisings that were foretold in that first charge sheet, but it was quashed as I pointed out. The second charge sheet and getting further particulars became an issue. By then we had only two counsel left, David Soggart and Harry Pittman. And we decided that if the judge was not going to listen to us in early September, I think it was 1975, we may as well withdraw the instructions of our counsel. And so on that morning, when the court was convened, um, the advocates pointed out that they, their instructions in this matter had been withdrawn. And so the judge says that please remain within the precincts. And he asks, who is the spokesman amongst the accused? And he asks me, are you Sadar Stephen Cooper? And I answer, yes. I point out, I speak for myself. I wish to ask for your recusal. This morning, I instructed my attorney that he should withdraw the brief of counsel acting for me because it has become increasingly evident that you have become guilty of prejudging the issues. I continue, I wish to place the following facts before this court when I was arrested, etc., etc., and that we'd been detained and we'd been subject to torture. I point out that different actions had been taken by us and how each of the accused was joined in our charge sheet. Point out that on the 12th of March, we appeared in this court and were assaulted in full public view after the case was remanded. Right in this court, we have been photographed and filmed and our people detained in the public gallery. Just yesterday, I was assaulted by two white policemen, numbers 39059 and 34672. On Tuesday, 21st April, the charge sheet was amended and the case adjourned to the 5th of May. On that day to the 7th of May, this court heard argument about applic the application for further particulars and that the state had replied in a slipshod and contemptuous manner. On the 21st of May, after judgment had been delivered a few days earlier, compelling the state to supply further particulars, the case was adjourned to the 9th of June. Then argument was made for the indictment to be quashed, the matter was postponed and so on. But also, although no agreement was reached between the prosecution and the defense, it appears that the judge president has imposed a date on us. And most important, persons here must just bow down to his wish, I say, to our embarrassment and prejudice. I also point out that the court ordered the counsel to argue. And I say your remarks to the judge, I say your remarks this Monday were misdirected in the extreme and showed the initial signs of prejudging the case. In fact, I got the impression that you were being high-handed and you were forcing our counsel into an untenable position of arguing the matter on the 6th of June. It was made clear by you, and I quote your words, had no sympathy for us. You felt our request, etc., was not bona fide. So we moved that application that we do not want the judge to preside over us, we're firing counsel. And Muntu continues. I'm not going to read all the uh, 
issues there. Uh, Muntu continues and he says he concurs and each of the accused concurred and they gave their own reasons. And Muntu wants to say, I note uh, that the stress, I'm, I want to stress that I'm completely satisfied with my counsel in the execution of their duty. However, I'm withdrawing my counsel for the reasons I shall now proceed to state. And he says, you made that order. I believe that my counsel will not be able to carry out my instructions. I feel that you have prejudged the matter and so on. And so it continues with each of the accused pointing out that the judge was biased. Um, and Muntu says, I have the impression that my defense counsel is being bulldozed in this court. I'm facing charges under the Terrorism Act. And the judge intervenes, and then Muntu continues. I'm facing a maximum penalty of death and a minimum penalty of five years imprisonment, if and when this court finds me guilty on this indictment. Therefore, it's imperative for me to know precisely what these allegations are. And it continues in that vein. So if you listen to the other co-accused, each one presents cogent arguments. And reading this, uh, I, de I decided to look at this, this just before this uh, session. It points to a certain courage. It points to a certain chutzpah that every one of us had. And Muntu says, I was kept in solitary confinement, incommunicado assaulted, subjected to the most inhuman treatment I've ever known or heard of by the security police. For four months, I lived under the worst conditions of existence, and this court, which today appears to be in a great hurry to try me, never lifted a finger to intervene. The same refrain comes from each of the accused. Nkwenkwe, Aubrey, Lekota, Pandalani Nefelo Wardwe, Kabaroni uh, Sedibe, Zitulele Tindi, and Srini Mugli. So the tone gets set by us. We are in a firing line situation where, on one occasion, it was the minister, well, it was actually the, the commissioner of police. Um, General Heldenes, Mike Heldenes, who himself, at that point, he was actually the deputy commissioner in charge of security. He oversaw his men um, in attempting to beat us into keeping quiet in court and not singing as we came up into the well of the court. So the court became, and uh, some writers, uh, commentators, have talked of the theater that was created because quite a few of us came from uh, theater backgrounds, but indeed that became the theater for the exposition of black consciousness. And whilst many of us were banned, our words were reported because of the fiction that anything said in court was reportable unless the court felt otherwise. So each of our testimony were covered in full by the press. By the time it came to Aubrey Mokwape's um, evidence, they discovered that Aubrey had been banned. Um, and so Aubrey wasn't, for, for whatever reason, covered uh, in, in the trial. But Srini, the, the ninth accused, was. And all of you know, it's legend now that Srini was charged with Steve Biko's writing because he did not give up who wrote the article. He said he wrote the article. And he was charged until Steve Biko testifies and says, I wrote those articles. But Srini had to be convicted. I need to also point out that our defense witnesses, as the convener pointed out now, Biko was the main defense witness. But on the 16th of April, 
well, not on the 16th, sorry, on the 29th of March, when we started our defense case, he was supposed to be the first witness. He was not there. Steve was nowhere to be found, but Rick Turner had been flown up, Rick Turner had been banned. And in 1978, he was murdered uh, in, a, in his house in Durban. So he had to testify. By the end of his testimony on the 1st of April, still no Steve. Manas Butelezi, the Bishop of the uh, Lutheran Church, came on next and he testified from the 2nd to the 5th of April. And yet, no Steve. Steve was driving. And I'm pretty sure, as I said before, he may not have had a license, but no policeman stopped him because he stopped at every little dorpi, met with people and so on, with complete immunity, knowing that if they arrested him, it would become a media spectacle. So I had to testify from the 12th of April and my testimony continued until the 3rd of May. It was at the end of April, not the end of March, that Steve finally appears. And of course, he allows uh, himself to spend time in Johannesburg, Pretoria, wherever, and eventually he then testifies from the 3rd to the 7th of May. And that testimony has been made famous through celluloid in Cry of Freedom. And the testimony of Steve Biko in the book that Millard Arnold puts out. I know that time is uh, not with us and I want to point out that when on the 17th of June, 1970. Let, let me mention this before that. In February, 1976, Seth Mazibuko, uh, Tiza Mazibuko, who was uh, secretary of the BPC, Drake Corker, a founder member of the BPC and convener of the BPC as it was being formed, Shlaku Kenny Rachidi, and a few others were brought to us in Pretoria prison as potential witnesses for us to uh, chat to about the testimony that they would potentially give. However, after the usual handshakes and hugs and everything else that we did, Kenny said, we're here because the opposition to Afrikaans is growing exponentially and something big is going to burst out. And when that happens, our fear is you will be convicted. There was silence. And we said, we have been leaders, but we're not leaders anymore. We're in prison. You are leaders, and the struggle shall continue. So it was no surprise, and I, as I pointed out in the first chart sheet, details how things can rise into um, what Soweto became. On the 16th of June, Labon Mabasa was testifying on the events uh, where he was a student in Turfloop, and the next day, under cross-examination, the judge's attitude indelibly changed from one of casual um, easiness after we had brought the application for his recusal uh, in September the previous year, he changed his attitude, it was, became easier. On the 17th of June, 1976, his attitude became totally closed and we knew we were going to be convicted. So here you have us sitting in court, knowing we're going to be convicted and we are found guilty in December, 1976. And we have a few days of the court taking a recess to allow us to prepare for mitigation. Each of us went into the box, witness box, and we 
were asked different questions. That the, the testimony we give in our mitigation, which actually is a celebration of struggle, is a book in itself. Each of my co-accused, I can proudly say, gave stirring testimony of what they did, why they did it, and why, if given the opportunity, we would invest more in the struggle. And of course, we were convicted. We were convicted. And by a quirk of the crowd actually starting to murmur, the judge turned back and said, for all those accused who have a second five-year sentence, four years shall run concurrently. If there wasn't a murmur from the crowd, Muntu, uh, Terra, Aubrey, Neff, and Nguenque and I would have been sentenced to 10 years. Thank heaven for our family, comrades, friends who were in the gallery for that howl of protest, which made the judge literally turn back and bend to the microphone and say, four years running concurrently. That convener, I want to end by, by pointing out that other trials took place during that period, notably Brayton Breitenbach and the trial uh, of some of the um, Nusas people who were, far, were charged uh, around that time. But in none of those trials did the accused have the kind of attitude that my fellow accused and I and our supporters, family and comrades shown. History was made and will continue to be made by that singular trial, which was, an, which was saying to people, if you were facing the death penalty, as Muntu pointed out, and yet you could take on the system, what else could we not do? And that became a spurt for other activity. I'll close there, Comrade Nodoba. Uh, thank you, thank you, Comrade Comrade Sets. Uh, you, your input uh, on this very instructive uh, topic uh, is uh, is very insightful, uh, and uh, I, I picked uh, a number of a number of, of points, uh, but uh, as I will be going through them, just to ask you. Uh, to help us understand more some of the issues that you raised. Uh, we will open to, I think, members uh, who are participating as well. We will see as they come in probably with questions. But uh, here is one uh, issue that, as we are talking, uh, came, came to mind. And uh, it begs the question that uh, the state, like you, have, you indicated, uh, viewed uh, black consciousness, it, it viewed the seriousness of black consciousness, the impact that it had. That's why it came uh, uh, like a ton of bricks upon black consciousness and black consciousness leaders. Now, the question that I have is, can we say that the state did succeed in crushing or weakening black consciousness? If it didn't, why is black consciousness today not at its peak as it was when you were on trial? Okay, that's a loaded question. Look, the, I pointed out that the state had, through its bannings and house arrest, instituted from February 1973 onwards. Anybody who came and became a leader and stepped into my or Steve or Harry or Barney's shoes was in turn banned. And that continued. In 73, well over 30 uh, of our key people were banned, house arrested, restricted to different magisterial areas. So the following year, 74, uh, the same year that Tiro is murdered, the movement was in disarray. This was the period where the ANC begins 
to start its resurgence and you will see that in Sasso. That Sasso leadership under Delizamji, um, Kosazana Zuma, both of them were from Natal Medical School, um, were the first in a line of persons who then begin to be closer to the ANC. And it continues from that point. So the Viva Frelimo rallies was a high point to rekindle and resuscitate, in fact, our waning fortunes. Um, persons were arrested, uh, detained. Musibudi um, Mangena was our first uh, person to be convicted and serving time in Robben Island, followed by SCARP. Um, and that started continuing slowly, uh, 75 into 76, until June 16th happened. So the trial became an epochal moment where more people began to shed themselves of their fear and identify with Black consciousness. So if you lived in that period, there was nothing else but Black consciousness, and you are Black and you are proud, older people, younger people, uh, including in high schools. And that's how SASM was formed. So the only game in town was now Black consciousness. The crescendo happened. And the last instruction that we had as the leadership joint with uh, the people who are not in prison was that we needed to unite the liberation movement. And Steve in particular was clearly on that path. In fact, the last words he uttered on the 5th of May, uh, we uttered on the 5th of May, I think it was when he finished his testimony. Uh, he had, you know, we shook hands and it was a lingering handshake. And we said, don't forget the mandate. And he acknowledged that. And that was to unite the liberation movement because let's be very frank, there was nothing happening outside of black consciousness. There were a few trials where um, MK persons uh, had infiltrated the country. And you, know, you had Mr. X or Mr. Y testifying as a roving witness throughout. In our trial, we did not have any Mr. X or Mr. Y. But what we did have was the spunk to mobilize our people publicly. We knew we would be arrested. We expected banning orders. With organizing the Viva Frilimo rally, we, Mutu and I understood very, very clearly that we're going to be arrested. And we, we needed to be prepared that the system will act against us. So when we were detained, we were not uh, as terrified of what happened. What happened was that 76 gave rise to huge possibilities. The liberation movement in exile was caught with its foot uh, completely uh, not on the ground. They did not anticipate what was going on. And indeed, the statements made by some people from exile was almost uh, poo-pooing the, the advent of what happened. One Zuma, um, I'm, I'm pretty certain not uh, J Jacob Zuma, uh, called, it an, uh, uh, called it all sorts of names. So 76, 77 were highlights of the struggle internally, the mobilization despite what was going on. And when Steve was on his quest to unite the liberation movement, he was sold out. He was sold out in Cape Town. He was sold out in the Eastern Cape. And he was sold out in exile. That's why that trip that was supposed to have happened where he, he was, was going to be flown out to meet with O.R. Tambo was canceled. So the pity is that we did not take up the cudgels and continue that action. But remember, the state banned 
19 of our organizations, to recover from that. And when you're so public in your political utterances, confirmed the old early 60s fear that you're going to be banned. The only avenue now is for us to go underground, arm struggle, etc., cetera, et cetera. So the rhetoric began to change. And instead of continuing the quest for uh, ensuring psychological liberation, instead of continuing that remit of conscientization, we began to get engaged in all sorts of other political activity, which is to be commended, but it gave rise after the bannings of the organizations in October 77. It gave rise to the ANC to enter that fray completely and take over. And Azapo, yes, was formed within a few months after the banning um, in April 78, but it never effectively got off the ground. And we've been perennially rent by uh, personal clashes, uh, inability to come to terms with what we needed to do publicly by closing ranks uh, internally. If I disagreed with you in charge, I go and form my own little uh, Cooper organization. And that's part of the sad demise of black consciousness as a political emancipatory mechanism for liberation in our country. Uh, thank you, Comrade. Thank you, Comrade Setz. Uh, you are touching on very interesting points, but uh, I will not go there. Particularly the issue uh, of, I think it might be a subject of another webinar, uh, whether as Black Consciousness Family and Organizations, we, we really uh, work the talk in terms of criticism and self-criticism. How do we take criticism? Uh, I will park that for now. But here is, uh, you see, some of our viewers are lamenting and they are saying, let me raise this with you. They say most of your generation, uh, I think you were called in Robben Island the club hoyers when you came in there. And uh, comrades from the older liberation movements are acknowledged. But it was, it was also before that. Okay. Before that, it was called the, so it, there was a Swartmach section created, right? Okay. And the Klipkoyer's name was given by the warders to diminish because these were, remember, these were uh, young men who escaped going to the border by remaining uh, as warders for two years as warders. Mm. And they were of the same age of the uh, 70s activists the 76 activists in particular. So it was good to diminish that. Mm. And that it's, it's ironical that the names the system gives us, parts of the liberation movement in turn uses again, instead of what is happening, particularly over the last year and a half and under COVID where there is recognition I'm hearing people who previously never said they were black consciousness saying, no, we all came from there. On chat groups, they continue saying that. We all came from there. And it's now time to go back to conscientizing, et cetera, et cetera. So don't diminish the trust of black consciousness and don't diminish its power as a vehicle to overcome this period. And thank you very much uh, for that. For that uh... I was saying, and, and, I, and I thank you for that, in terms of what we internalize. We internalize, because Black Consciousness primarily says we need to define ourselves. We need to make the world to view us on our terms. And I thank you for that. But the viewers are saying, ask Umkulwa Utata Ukupa, when are they, the remaining core of his generation, when are they producing a book? So that they don't just become working encyclopedia, but we've got it documented. So that, and they are saying here, uh, Comrade said, 
you can see this coming up, right? It comes and then it gets suppressed. It comes up, it gets suppressed. They say you can see this mushrooming, that sense of, uh, of defiance of people who are brave enough to stand for their rights, to affirm and assert themselves. You can see that in the Fees Must Fall movement, in the Roads Must Fall movement. It was an indication uh, of the yin towards black consciousness. Now, the, the appeal here and the lamentation is, when are we getting this rich history in book form? Well, I know that my fellow trialists and I have been doing this. We've been in our, in our uh, and, and expect that uh, within the next uh, year and a half, two years, there will be um, something that will be, I think within the, by next year, there will be announcements about some of these things. I don't want to uh, put more pressure on my fellow uh, uh, co-accused, uh, but we have committed to doing this and we are, uh, we've started that and we're capturing that stuff. The, the material is immense. And as mm. we begin to look at it, you know, it's like me looking at this, what, what was said uh, in court, it starts taking you to another direction. So we, we've been, uh, we are uh, found guilty of not paying attention to that and we will rectify that. Uh, that commitment is there. Okay, thank you very much. It brings me to the issue of the epistemology that you raised. So apartheid uh, brings up, and the issue that you talked about, trying to vilify us, uh, trying to uh, make belittle uh, the importance of black consciousness. Now, the, ep the epistemology of apartheid was meant to, de to dehumanize the black people and the essence of blackness. Now, we've seen a movement coming up in, 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 education, in, in institutions of higher education known as the movement for for decolonization, the decolonization of the curriculum. And this says to the ordinary Mr. Average in the street that it would mean that the curriculum that we have is anchored on an epistemology that is anti the essence of blackness, hence the need and the call for decolonization. Yeah. What role? Can black consciousness, in your view, what do you think, what role can BC play in this movement of decolonization? Because we don't hear the black consciousness perspective on decolonization. Uh, your reflections and your views. Well, look, I think there are important scholars in this country in particular who are um, working on the linkage uh, between the a liberatory position of black consciousness and uh, its relevance in the decolonization, the decoloniality project, if you like. Um, I think that um, for some of us, we need to actually show the, the theoretical underpinnings of black consciousness and its denouma, its development, in a way that shows the praxis for liberated thinking. And that can only be done by some of us. It can't be done by those who are going to go and learn about it. Because you see, internally, if you don't have it, you're not going to have it through a third party. About and that is important. Uh, and uh, this is the quest. I know that some of the my fellow, uh, you know, founding members of Sasso BPC on this platform and elsewhere are about. And it, 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 we need to make that statement because decolonization has now become a favorite uh, epithet to throw around. But unless it seriously is based in the, what to use Marxian terminology, the objective material conditions of people. It will be meaningless as a way forward. So we need 
to translate that. So that translation has to happen, but also in terms of the epistemology, what happens is we tend to get caught up in the method, the, the, uh, the, the positivist Weberian uh, method of science. And we don't look at ourselves and our development of our struggle, our rationale for it, and our action based on that understanding, which is a method, but we don't capture that, you see. And that's what I think we need to do rather than relying on any ism out there, which actually does not explain that condition from the slave position, from the slave, from the oppressed position, from the truly exploited and understanding it position. Because if you don't understand, you're a slave. If you don't understand, you've been an oppressed. And now I shall not be an oppressed and how I rise above it. Nobody else can explain that. You get all the kinds of claptrap that you get where people try to continue diminishing the centrality of black expression to validate the quest for true humanity. It cannot be from somewhere else, however much you want it to be. Now, uh, Comrade says, just to piggyback on what you just said, here is a view that says, we have gone into the mode of electioneering. Yes. Come 1st of November, we are going to cast our votes in the local government elections. The ruling party is being accused of purporting a campaign where it hands out or it dishes, dishes out what is known as the RDP houses, social grants, uh, issues like saying pregnant women must be given children's grants and so on. And all that is made to who the voter to vote for them. Now, the school of thought that it comes to the question says, how is this a form of, how, how is this form of campaigning an attack on black people's identity, on the character of black people? And uh, how does it affect uh, black solidarity? Oh, it has a profoundly destructive effect because what it does is, it renders the majority of people, the mass of our denied humanity, that position to being, and that position of being then becomes almost a non-existent, you know, you, because you're not dealing then with people you're dealing with a receptacle, a recipient of somebody's largesse. And the education that has been so dumbed down, I'm, I, must, I must quote, uh, you know, Nkwenko and Komo said, and I had this discussion, uh, I think it was end of last year, um, perhaps it was beginning of this year, where we talked of uh, education, and he, he said, you know, apartheid failed, but these guys succeeded. If you have 30% as your pass mark, instead of having 70% as your pass mark, the quest for excellence is impacted. You will get what Sobokwe called voting cattle, and that's what's happening. So, you cannot compete in that space. What you've got to do is you've got to acknowledge that people are in dire poverty. If the statistics are to be believed, over 60% of our population live in dire, dire poverty. And 74.7%, this is a statistic of a couple of months ago this year, 
of young people in their mid-teens to mid-twenties are out of school, out of work. And they're not ever going to get work because technology has overtaken things. There's new ways to create commerce and to commune, which we're not utilizing and which we're not imparting to people out there. So anybody who stands up there and says, we're gonna create jobs is lying. No jobs are gonna be created. Indeed, unless you're a totally uh, centrally controlled economy, you cannot create those jobs. And you know that in the past few years in particular, more and more of state and enterprises have become privatized. ESCOM is, 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 is been uh, deconstructed in many ways and other areas of activity are going to happen. So I think it's, it's, it's about when all looks bleak and dim, it's about speaking, being black together and what that condition of denial, of denuding, of oppression and exploitation means that while you're getting that, are you not a receptive? You know, you need to explain it in ways that people can understand and identify with so that it becomes a point of conscientization rather than it getting viewed as a point of attack. Whereas we, the intellectuals, know this, but you, the people on the ground, are fools in this enterprise. You know, that, that mentality needs to, to, to end. We, there needs to be true identity. And to do that, you need to work with people. You cannot operate from a sloganeering position. Uh, Comrade says, while we are there, uh, here is a school of thought that says, as much as black consciousness, I mean, the, for, uh, the, the forums, yourselves, Comrade Biko, uh, you mentioned a number of comrades, uh, uh, Comrade uh, PC Jones, Comrade Harry Nguyenkulu, while you were uh, anchored on black self solidarity, black solidarity, but also the coming together of the liberation movements. There are components in the liberation movement that argue that black consciousness uh, lacked what they call the essence of being liberatory. Hence, all efforts were made to make sure that uh, it's not supported internationally and so on. The PCMA then, which most into us up, never had the support and so on and so on. What would you say to that? What would you say to this particular view that uh, black consciousness led the essence of being a, liber a liberatory philosophy or ideology? That's a, that's a lie. That's an outright lie because <laughs> black consciousness in its very essence and however you want to look at it is liberatory you know that's why any of us who are truly conscientized can be in a sea of foreignness you can be in a sea of whiteness and negativity and you will not be put down you will not allow yourself to be put down that is why we surrounded by security policemen armed to the teeth would never cow down to them because that idea is one that is liberate. I'm, I know I sound messianic, but the fact is once you know black conscious, when you know you're black, there's no other way that you will ever espouse anything else. If you espouse other modalities, maybe in a quest for that liberation, fine. I have no problem with that. But to diminish the essence of black consciousness is part of that onslaught that all of you are talking about against black consciousness. So it's time we forgot that, we, we ignored, uh, uh, let me retract, forget, ignored the onslaught because it will be there. It's a political onslaught. What we need to do is forget anybody who is not BC, but what Steve was on the quest about in 1977 
Why can't we do that amongst ourselves? You know, I asked the question in one of the chat groups, I think it was yesterday or the day before, how many BC groups are there? You know, today it's called this, tomorrow it's called that. I don't know who these groups are, by the way. And frankly, I don't care. What we should do is if we speak black solidarity, the onus is on all those leaders out there to do something about it, not carry on just before election time and spout, oh, you know, let's talk unity. No, 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 no. You need to see unity in action. And I think I need to say this, that one of the problems when you've got three or four of these factions or however you want to look at it, when they come together, two, three, four into one won't go. You, need, you can only do with one president, with one chair, with one secretary general, with one treasurer. Who else is going to play a back role? That is the demise of the modern day post Azapo iteration of black consciousness. We saw it in exile. We saw people forming their own groups. And that's why BCMA, BCM, uh, had to, BCMA had to be fully coordinated at that point because individuals were going their own way. We're seeing it now, each one pulling their own way. So if you had, Whoever is the leader, I don't know who's the leader of which entity now, besides I know Strike uh, as the leader of Azapo. If we all beyond this election, maybe on the 2nd of November, came together and say, now let's ignore all this stuff and create one entity. And perhaps make each of the persons who's a leader now not be eligible for election to the top positions. You'll see how far we will go. You need, a break, you need a break from the past and the past and the current leadership. We need people who are going to be an array from young to the 70s generation. But it should not be dominated by one or the other. And we need to ensure the diversity, particularly with regard to gender, which we don't have. So the analogy a comrade says will be the one of a seed that for it to give birth to a new plant. Absolutely. And if Biko died for it, we must. Uh, we can do it for ourselves, not with other liberation, but amongst ourselves, with whatever we're calling ourselves, uh, unity or disunity or together. But maybe on the 2nd of November, whoever is brave enough to do it, I think we'll, be, we'll see the seeds uh, okay. in two years' time. The old must die. Now, as we close, uh, Comrade says, as we close, uh, I've been getting a lot of comments, but as we close, uh, we are getting your reflections, uh, getting back and, 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 and getting the, the, the salient points of this topic. Uh, blackness on trial, 1975-2076, was this really a catalyst for the Zanian revolution? Can it be seen like that? Uh, I want you to also reflect. Uh, one of your colleagues, uh, uh, by the way, as you had correctly indicated, you are a former president of ASAPO. I think it's just before you went to the States and so on, you are a former president. So I must acknowledge that from the chair. Uh, to say one of your colleagues has just published a book and in it, I mean, it says we can fix ourselves, uh, which means we are a people in need of fixing. But those of us who are here to break conscience, like you are saying, we ourselves are not behaving as people who are fixed, who must now then bring this antidote to society and help society. Now, he, he puts it in the book that uh, for us to solve most of our, he doesn't say all our problems. He seems to say that we need black consciousness as an antidote. And I think he is part of uh, our meeting here. Would you agree with that? that the black consciousness would be in the doubt and then you will then summarize and close for us. Thank you. Look, uh, I, as I pointed out throughout my uh, talk today in different ways, black consciousness is an essential prerequisite to rid ourselves of all the anti, of all the deprecatory that seems to overcome us. And I agree with Musibudi that it can be an antidote in these terrible times where nothing is holding. 
and for it to be the antidote to the negativism and the resurgence of narrow ethnicity, to the resurgence of the, of the terminology uh, non-white and further deprecation of our identity and self. We need basic black consciousness as a quest to restoring our common humanity. We are human beings. We are all made of the same flesh and blood. External appearances create that wealth of diversity that we definitely need. We, it would be, I've said this before, it'd be a boring world. If you and I looked the same, walked the same, talked the same, and jived the same, we need that diversity. And that is what we have. At the same time, let's rid ourselves of the need for personal leadership and that perpetuation. Let us ensure that bright, smart people around us take that analogy that has been raised before a long time ago, take that bait, baton forward. If we don't, this country is, continues on the slippery slide to self and other destruction, and we will rue the day by the time we reach 30 years of our democracy. Failed state will be complete and all vestiges of self-pride of identity, of feeling equal will be gone. Dictatorship will persist. Thank you for those words of wisdom, uh, Comrade Sets. You have heard from the former president of Azapo, former uh, Robben Islander, an inmate in Robben Island, a comrade who was on trial for the beliefs of making sure that uh, blackness is not diminished. The message is, let us pick up the cudgels of struggle and let pettiness not be what drives us, but let selflessness, let uh, black self-pride, black solidarity, excellence and self-love be the values that drive us. Comrade says on behalf of the online uh, political education Azapo uh, uh, for forum, we, we thank you very much for having made time. And we thank all the viewers in the country, in the diaspora, in the world for having joined us. Thank you, Comrade Sets, and thank you very much until we meet each other again. We close with our legendary song. Pleasure. Thank you very much, Cheryl.